We're very privileged to have Jerry here with us. Many of you know him from his coaching tenure at Michigan where he and Bo were together for over 20 years. And uh, the thing I always remember about Jerry isn't so much his coaching, but his radio broadcast. I don't know how many of you remember, he and Frank Beckman used to do the Michigan games on WJR. And uh, Jerry was always his frank self. I remember one call by an official, and Jerry said, Frank, that's the worst call I've seen in 60 years. And uh, he went on to explain. A week later, there was another infraction, and Jerry said, Frank, that's the worst call I've seen in 60 plus years. <laughs> Oh, I love the guy, and still do. Jerry Hanlon. What can a beat up old football coach say to this group? You've already had entertainment up here with jokes and so forth. I've heard about everybody's travels and things like that. So what can I say that can top any of those things? You know, I've been in this business for so long, and I think the only reason you ask me here is you wanted to find somebody older than the oldest guy in this room. <laughs> and you've achieved it. Uh, I remember speaking to this group on several occasions, and I noticed that after I spoke, I wasn't invited back for at least two or three years. So I guess after today, I won't have to bother with you again for a while. They asked me to come here and talk a little bit about football. They're playing a game today that I don't know much about. Yes, I do. But it's not the same game that Coach Hamlin got to coach. Football is not what I would like to see it be, but it's still the greatest game a young man can play. For you see, it teaches things that you can't get any place else on this campus, or for that matter, maybe on this earth. Because a young man that takes himself and makes a football player has to go through an awful lot. And in that travel, there are so many great things to be learned. And if it's done right, and if they're read, led properly, they become young men who I stand here before you and say, they are my proudest possessions. They come back to see me. I don't care if they're a doctor. I don't care if they're a lawyer. I don't care if they teach. I don't care if they sell. I don't care what they do. Most of them are good husbands, good fathers, and good citizens of the communities that they live in. If I have a legacy, I don't want it to be known that Jerry Hammond, the great coach, or Jerry Hammond, the broadcaster, I want to be known as somebody who helped a young man be a better person. You sitting out there have those opportunities too. Maybe not on the football field, but you too have wisdom. You too have had experiences. I challenge you to get more young people involved, not only in the community, but in what you do. 
For you see, we're going to live by our young ones. I only see two here today. <laughs> it's nice to see them. Even if he does need a damn haircut, I'll have to. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> but really, I think there's an opportunity for a group like this not only to help the community, but to take the young men who will become a part of that community and get them more involved in things that they can learn from. Now, after all that spouting, tell us about Harbaugh. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I coached the offensive line here most of my career. And then all of a sudden, we got a young kid in here whose father had coached with us, and he had spent most of his time running around on the football field, getting in the middle of my drills. And I told him, get out of here. I don't want you to hurt any of our players. I don't care about you, but stay out of my drills. You understand that? <laughs> And that young man's name was Jimmy Harbaugh. And so when he came in here, Bo says, Hanlon, you're going to move from being the offensive line coach to the quarterback coach. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, why did I do? What did I do to deserve this? He was the hardest and the easiest young man I ever coached. He was such a competitor, he could not stand everybody not going as hard as he does. You read it in the newspapers today. He is still that way. Our first experience wasn't exactly the best for a coach and a player. I was... Uh, Jimmy would go out on the field and he would throw a pass and it would be from here to those windows over the head of the receiver. And the receiver would be running and he'd look up and he'd say, oh, and then he'd slow down and go back and get in line. And Jimmy would go, what'd you stop for? Why didn't you keep running? Dive for that football. Because that's what he would have done. But our receivers didn't take that too well. And so it got to be, a, I thought, getting to be a little bit of a problem. So I called him in to the office. And we sat down, closed the door. I said, Jimmy, who's the quarterback on this team? He says, I am, coach. I said, I'm good. I said, who's the coach on this team? He said, you are, coach. And I said, you play quarterback. Wow, coach. Do you understand that? <laughs> yes, coach. Got up, walked out. We did not talk except for football for the next seven weeks. I mean, it, we were family. I mean, he was raised with my kids and I knew his mom and dad and we used to talk about none of that. It was strictly football. And it was about, we played, I think, uh, the game before we played Purdue. I hear a knock on the door. And he comes in and he closes the door. And he says, Coach, I don't like this. And I said, I don't either, to be honest with you. He said, I know I was wrong. And he said, I don't want this to go on. I want us to be like we used to be. And from that day on, Jimmy Harbaugh became another son of mine. And we've been that way for a long, long time. Now he's too busy for the old man. <laughs> <laughs> I was just down two days ago and we had a chance to visit. And I had to kid him. I said, uh, here, here, Sarah's gonna have a Maybe, oh, yeah, yeah, I said, 
I said, who's the father? You sure as hell never around. <laughs> and he kind of looked at me and laughed. He said, give me those kind of jokes. They're always talking about me having a gra my own grandchildren. I said. <laughs> but we still get a chance to sit down once in a while and talk. But what he's doing is trying to build a program in a system today which is very hard to do. For you see, football was primarily made and played for the good of the kids, for the kids to play the game, for the fans who got to come and watch, and for the students who became participants. Now, it's the cash cow of the university. And I'm not sure that's exactly what it's designed to be. It sure does help a lot of people. But I tell Jimmy when I get a chance. Now, whether or not he listens, I have no idea. Don't forget, it's still a game for the young men that play it. And when we forget that, then let's don't play the game anymore. I only hope he has great success this year. Everybody said he had a great first year. Mm -hmm. Do you know what Brady Hope's record was after his first year? <laughs> he wasn't around very long, was he? <laughs> you people are not very patient <laughs> when it comes to winning. But I think Jimmy and his staff will turn out a great program again this year. I only hope that the young men who played the game as when we played it turn out to be the same type of young men that I was able to coach. Again, you've got an old, beat up football coach up here spouting out things that probably are way above his head. But I ran across something because I was grabbed a bunch of stuff as I was starting out the door today. And I told you that I was old. And I am. And I came across this, and I've kept it for years and years. You can see it's yellowed and everything else. And it's something I'm going to leave you with, because I look around this room and some of you are getting near to where I'm going to be. <laughs> it was something that was said or written by Douglas MacArthur. It had nothing to do with war, except maybe it does have a little to do with war, a different kind of war. In spirit, we are young. No one grows old by merely living a number of years. People grow old by deserting their ideals. Years may wrinkle the skin, but to give up interest wrinkles the soul. In the central place of every heart, there's a recording chamber. So long as it receives messages of beauty, hope, cheer, and encouragement, so long are we young. When the wires are all down and your heart is covered with the snows of pessimism and the ice of cynicism, then and only then are you grown old? I will do my level best to never grow old. You too, keep all those things. Keep 
that heart open. Enjoy the people around you. And for God's sakes, those of you who are lucky enough to have a wife who does things for you that you never, ever know about. Go home, kiss her on the cheek, and say thank you, because you don't know your blessings. God, you're quiet. <laughs> I, what, you have a question back there? I wasn't going to let anybody ask anybody. All right, go ahead. Uh, Dan David, what aspects of the current institution of college football do you think need to be changed to go back closer to what it used to be? Well, I, I don't know that you can do it anymore. As I said, it's become a, uh, a money maker. And the money is the number one thing that's now being playing football on Thursday nights and Wednesday nights and and uh, Saturday uh, nights and things like that, and then expect the kids to be able to graduate and and get their grades and all that. It's it's uh, it doesn't fit. The two don't seem to go together to me. That there's more. It's more important as. Uh, Don Canham used to say, don't let the pros play in our stadium and don't let the television decide what we're going to do with football. And that's exactly what's taken over. Uh, not the stadium, it's still our place. But the fact is that television tells you not only who you're going to play, but when you're going to play. And, and I hope they ever come in there and tell me how I got to play, and then that would really bother me. Yes? Coach George Gilligan, uh, how about a couple of your favorite Bo Jerry stories? Oh, <laughs> well, I can't say those in public. <laughs> no, Bo and I had uh, a, a, a very different relationship, I'll be honest with you. Uh, uh, he was a very stubborn, uh, German kraut. <laughs> I was a very stubborn Irish, whatever you call me, <laughs> and we used to bump heads quite often. But we did it in a way that I always got hired one more time than I got fired. <laughs> And somebody once asked me, what's the secret of coaching with Shem Beckler? I said, that's what it is. Always get hired one more time and you get fired. And I did. <laughs> but it's the truth. I, we, we really did have some knockdown drag outs. And the problem was that this is, Bo was pretty uh, tyrannical when it came to running his program. He was going to do it the way he wanted to do it. And he wasn't always right. And so somebody had to tell him when he was wrong. And so all the other coaches would look at me, and so then I guess I was designated because, uh, but we did argue quite a bit. But when we decided what we were going to do, then we were like this. No one was going to separate us. So when it came time to football games, I would, of course, I was in a, I, somebody asked me about Football. I've never seen a football game in Michigan Stadium from the sidelines. Never. Now, I've seen a couple of plays, but not a game. I've always been in the press box. And the main thing was to keep Shem Beckler and I separated so we wouldn't uh, get into it. But uh, if you would have heard some of those conversations that went back and forth on that wire, you would really have been... Uh, astonished. But when we decided what we were going to do, it was usually the right thing. And if it wasn't, we both took blame for it. I, I never had him say, oh yes, he had, damn you Hammond, what would you call that for? That's if it didn't work. 
I told him I didn't call that one. I said, you over overruled me. That's the reason it didn't work. <laughs> but uh, it, was, uh, it was certainly a very interesting relationship. And uh, the day before he died, I was down at the football building, and he had a little office up there, and I stopped in, and we were talking old times and what was going on with football today and how much better coaches we are or were than they are today and all those kind of things. And he said, Lloyd asked me to talk to the team. He said, I don't know what I'm going to say to him. And I said, all right. I said, I'll go over and stand in the back and see if you still got it. <laughs> so I went over and went to the back of the room and stood up there and he came in and he gave a marvelous talk uh, before uh, the, I think it was the Ohio State game of that year. And uh, after it was over with, I walked down and as I was coming out, he was coming out the front door as I was coming around the side. And he looked over at me and he said, what do you say? I said, coach, you still got it. And we walked out together. And the very next day, he passed away in that down Detroit area. So it's, uh, when you talk about uh, my relationship with Bo, it would take a lot longer than any of you want to hear and sit and listen about. But if there ever was uh, two guys who probably were meant to work together, I would say we were two of them. I learned a lot from him, and I hope that he learned a few things from me. But I know this, the kids that played for him were scared to death of him <laughs> the first year, were mad as hell out of him the second year, hated him the third year, and loved him when they graduated. If all of us could treat our kids in such a manner, this place would be a better world. Thank you for having me. Hope you have a good day. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.